Hi everybody, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and it is your weekly space hangout for Friday, March 1st, 2013, with our very special guest, Alan Stern. Uh, Alan's going to be talking about uh, Uingu and the Golden Spike and the cool news about the, uh, the new uh, Pluto stamp campaign. So we're going to be talking about that in a second. But before we get to that, I just want to introduce everybody who is joining us uh, this week. So we've got Amy Shira Title from Vintage Space. Hello. Amy. We've got Dr. Ian O'Neill from Discovery. Uh, we've got Jason Major from Universe Today and other places. Uh, we've got Nicole Gallucci, Dr. Nicole Gallucci, a.k.a. the Noisy Astronomer. I'll get that, that right makes me happy. Eventually. <laughs> Eventually. It's still weird for me, so it's fine. Yeah, I know. It's yeah, doubly weird for me, yeah. Uh, and we've got Scott Lewis, who we uh, noticed at the beginning, aka the bald astronomer, and my co-host on the Virtual Star Party. So uh, so this week, we've got, we're going to be talking about galactic cannibalism, baby planets, spinning black holes, the 2018 mission, and, uh, and what we're going to be doing at South by Southwest. And also, we know that right now, this the weekly space hangout is running concurrent to the uh, the the SpaceX press conference to talk about what's going on with the with the Dragon, and it is sort of kind of some big news. It's actually been a lot of events have been happening. So before we get to talk to Alan Stern, we just want to give people a really quick update in case you wanted the the synopsis as opposed to uh, you know go over there. But we appreciate if you're watching us as opposed to to that. So now Jason and Ian, I know you guys have been following us. So Jason. What's the su sort of update with the uh, with the Dragon launch? Well, right now, I mean, there's there's a uh, uh, there's actually really good news. Um, what happened was this morning there was a beautiful launch uh, from Cape Canaveral. The Falcon 9 uh, lifted off as scheduled. Everything was nominal. Um, you know, it, 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 it orbital insertion occurred uh, just as you know it was supposed to with the Dragon capsule. At the moment when the solar panels were supposed to deploy, they didn't. So what ended up happening was the, the, you know, the camera shut off and, you know, they said, okay, well, there's been a slight anomaly, we'll have a press conference. And then everybody started waiting and listening and seeing what was happening. So, you know, Twitter was all a tweet and, uh, and everyone wanted to know, you know, what's, what's up with the Dragon capsule. Um, turns out there were some, there were some computer problems. Uh, they did not deploy the solar panels. They didn't take the, the solar panel covers did not come off. Um, and there were some problems with the thruster pods. So what ended up happening was we, they, uh, they had to f basically figure out how to get those pods back online. At first, there was only one pod came back online, and it takes two to get to the ISS. Uh, docking is scheduled tomorrow. Uh, but recently, we just got some great news that two of the four thruster pods are back online. So whether or not you know, it, it's actually going to uh, remain on schedule for tomorrow remains to be seen. But two of the thrust pods are back online. The uh, Dragon capsule is under control. So hopefully cool. uh, everything goes well and they can, they can birth to the space station. Okay, fantastic. And I know we've, you know, normally we'd have Alan Boyle and uh, Nancy Atkinson, and they're actually participating in the conference right now. They're watching it, and they're going to be reporting on it. One of them might show up later on during this show, and if not, you know, I know that uh, Ian and Jason will be monitoring the news, and maybe we'll give an update uh, closer to the end of the of the show. So, all right, let's get on to the main event. So we've got uh, <clears throat> we've got Alan Stern who has joined us before, but he's back with some additional news. And last time he was talking about uh, Pluto and his, uh, his campaign to get Pluto on some stamps. So, Alan, can you give us an update on that? And then we're going to talk about all the other really cool things that you're working on. Yeah. How's it going? Great. Uh, you know, actually, this is about New Horizons uh, going to Pluto. And, of course, New Horizons is now about 80% of the way through the journey. We're in the seventh year of a nine-year trip across the solar system. We had a Jupiter flyby in 07. We've been uh, cruising the spacecraft, planning the encounter ever since, and it's the year after next, so we're excited. Last year, uh, we started a campaign uh, with the uh, U.S. Postal Service uh, to have a stamp commemorating this first exploration of, uh, of the Pluto system. Uh, there's been a stamp for uh, the first exploration of every planet, and the current Pluto stamp says not yet explored. We want to get that changed, so we put in a proposal we had a petition, about 12,000 people signed on to that very quickly, and the news is that the post office has agreed to consider our proposal. Now, that doesn't mean that they'll agree to a stamp, but it's a huge hurdle because most proposals they receive don't even get reviewed. So we're really happy about that and excited. We probably won't know until encounter year in 2015, but um, we're holding our breath and uh, hoping for the best. 
Well, all I ask as a Canadian, I'm not going to be able to buy them. So all I ask is that you, you know, someone mails me a letter with a Pluto stamp, with a New Horizons Pluto stamp on it. That's all I ask. I'll send you a postcard. That'd be Thank great. You. Send me a postcard from Pluto. Yeah, Pluto stamp there. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So let's talk about the uh, the other projects. I mean, last time we talked, you, I guess, were working on this stuff, but you were keeping it very, very under wraps, and we had no idea. But now, in the last couple of months, you've come live with all of these projects that you're working on, Uingu and Golden Spike, just in the last little while. So can you give us sort of the overview of what these projects are? Sure. Which one would you like to start with? Well, let's start with Uingo only because it launched first, and then I know Golden Spike is the more recent announcement, so why don't we, we'll yeah. spend a little more time with well, that. We started, um, uh, you, you probably first heard of Uingu, which is the Swahili word for the sky. You probably first heard of our company uh, last summer when we uh, kicked off some of the operations publicly uh, with a uh, crowdsourcing campaign, a crowdfunding campaign on the platform called Indiegogo. And uh, uh, the purpose of this company is to help people everywhere across the world interact better with astronomy, to connect to the sky, as we say. And uh, we're putting together a series of apps that we think will be very popular. And we're taking the money after we pay our light bills and our internet bills and so forth. The money is really to generate a grants fund for space research and space education. It's for social good. We're pretty excited about it. We, um, we had our crowdsourcing campaign. Uh, we had a goal of raising $75,000. We exceeded that. Uh, the campaign concluded in September. We'd raised about 80000 In fact, Indiegogo told us that it's one of the 25 largest campaigns that had happened uh, out of 44000 up to that date yeah, on the Indiegogo platform. And then we went kind of quiet. We went and uh, put our website together, wrote a lot of software, got our business operations set up, and then surfaced in November for beta testing of our first product, which is about naming the extrasolar planets, all of them. It's estimated that there are 160 billion with a B. That's about 20 for every person on Earth, 22 actually, uh, in our, just in our galaxy. This is too big a job for just us astronomers like myself. And, and so uh, we are now operating, as of this week, a commercial website where people can nominate names for planets. And there's no end to it. If you want to name it after your friends or your colleagues, do it. For your family, please do it. For your favorite sports team or stars, for your hometown, whatever. And what's really cool is that not only can you nominate names, uh, but you can vote for the names that are out there, your own or other people's that you like. Uh, and people are already putting up politicians. Somebody put up Elon Musk just yesterday. Uh, we want to conduct some contests and see what are the most popular names that people around the world like, in what languages, what will float to the top. And we're actually going to give that to the exoplanet community for specific planets around other stars. So we're pretty excited about it. And we hope people will come to our website. You can just Google Uwingu or go to www.uwingu.com and uh, give it a whirl. Uh, it's uh, 99 cents to vote for your favorite. It's 4.99, and the money goes to science and education. And we hope that everybody out there uh, will give it a try today. And I think that's a really important distinction because there's these name a star companies that you know make money by getting people to name stars and. You know, they're really just taking the money and they're updating some database and saying that they've named a star, but and people think that it's official, but it's actually not. And they keep the money and they have no relation really to the astronomy community in general. And I think what you know what you're doing is helping raise money to actually discover these exoplanets in the first place and for future kinds of projects like this. And then as part of that, as a way to kind of generate revenue for these kinds of science campaigns to be able to give people the opportunity to name them. And I think it's really important that the big difference with what you're doing and with what the, you know, the name of star people are doing is, is that your money's going to science. And this well, is really timely with, um, we're talking in the U.S. about the sequestration coming up um, and a lot of science research and, and especially science education is going to be on the chopping block and so these these other methods of raising money is is really something that I'm looking forward you to. You know we're really we hope other people will get ideas too and help pioneer this new way because in the past there's only been two ways to do to fund astronomy and space projects either you go to the government which of course has money problems now or uh, you go to a foundation where people just give out of their heart this is a new model more 21st century where you put something out there that people actually will enjoy doing as a pastime or hobby, as a, uh, a conversation piece maybe, 
uh, you know, stocking stuff or gifts or uh, whatever kind of holiday gifts around the office. Hey, we put in all of your names for planets around the galaxy. Isn't that cool? And the money goes to science. So it's actually a product that people buy. And as a result, uh, we feed the coffers for science. And we're already funding the SETI Institute, Astronomy Without Borders, the Galileo Teachers uh, Telescope Project, and several others. Uh, the Purdue Minority Education Program, I could go on. Our, our ambition is to have hundreds of projects under our wing and to be a real source uh, for space exploration and research money and space education too. So let's talk about the Golden Spike then because that's more recent. Sure. Well, you know, you see that behind me. Uh, Golden Spike is a commercial space company that's in the business of, uh, actually we're the first company in the business of uh, conducting human lunar expeditions. Uh, we spent about two years, we have a very talented team of ex-NASA executives, rocket engineers, some venture capital people, some people in the media business, putting together a business model that actually works. And we found a way, uh, and it's pretty pretty easy actually, uh, we're using systems that already exist, rockets like the Falcon 9 and the Atlas V, for example, capsules, Dragon could be a, a, a candidate capsule, things that have already been built, so we don't have to invent them from scratch. We found a way to conduct two-person human lunar expeditions like the early Apollo missions, but for costs that are down in the range of less than Curiosity, about half the cost of the Curiosity rover, in the range of about a billion and a half dollars, which many nations can afford. And so our goal is, is for American flight systems, uh, rockets, capsules, and landers, uh, to fly uh, large numbers of lunar exploration missions in the 2020s, taking the rest of the world along, uh, through their science agencies and space agencies, and we're very excited about it. And you can even get involved. Uh, I spoke about that Indiegogo campaign that helped fuel the startup Uwingu. Uh, actually, Golden Spike is conducting an Indiegogo campaign right now as well to raise two hundred and forty thousand dollars. That's a number that might ring in some people's minds. It's a dollar for every mile on the way to the moon. We just started it. We've got about eight weeks to go, and well, we hope that people who are lovers of space exploration, commercial space. Uh, we'll come and uh, uh, take a look, go to the Indiegogo website, look us up, Google Indiegogo Golden Spike, and um, come and help. And so, I mean, the goal here is to actually have send humans back to the moon. Yes, and again and again and again in a sustainable way, and to explore the moon. Imagine the science that we can do with 20 Apollo-class expeditions in the 21st century, in the, tw night, night, in the 2020s. See, so that sounds... Kind of um, difficult, you know. They've, how difficult has been for NASA to even kind of get the the moon missions getting back online and getting people back to the moon? So, so why do you feel well, like this? You know, that the private, I guess, fundraising method is going to work more than well, NASA. First, first, let me be clear: we're not trying to raise money for these expeditions um, uh, through private fundraising like this. In fact, um, our our business will run on the sales of these expeditions to foreign countries or to companies and individuals who might want them. Uh, they're a billion and a half dollars a piece. But also recognize when NASA put Project Constellation together, they started with a clean sheet of paper for every rocket, every capsule, and every, every uh, lander and surface system. And so the cost ran up past $150 billion before it collapsed under its own weight. By using existing systems, we've got the cost down in the range of about seven or eight billion dollars for the first expedition and then to repeat at a billion and a half a piece we think it's very sustainable because that's like the cost that countries are now spending on big ticket flagship robotic missions and you know nine countries have flown missions to the moon in the last decade India, China, uh, other examples are Europe, the United States uh, now we're seeing um, uh, Korea get interested, Germany get interested uh, it's going to be exciting, and we think it's entirely doable, and lots of countries will want to join that club of planetary exploration with their own people, exploring the surface and returning samples. So it's almost like a way for some of these countries to jump to the, to the top of the list, to be able exactly. to be the, you know, who's going to be the first person with their boots back on the ground on the moon. Who wants to be first after Apollo? Will it be Israel, Saudi Arabia, perhaps yeah. South Africa? We'll see. And I want to be clear, the Indiegogo campaign, um, is helping us get started, but it's not meant to fund a multi-billion dollar exercise. In fact, um, we really only started the Indiegogo campaign because we got, and I'm not exaggerating, we got thousands 
of emails and Facebook posts and others saying, how can we help? I want to get involved. I want to see this for my kids. I want to see it in my lifetime. So we launched the Indiegogo campaign about two weeks ago. I mean, one of the feelings that I've really had, and I've seen a lot of, of, of this with just my response with the public as well, is that there really is a huge grassroots interest in getting space exploration and a real frustration with how slow the government and, you know, NASA and even, you know, other countries have gotten. And that's why I think you're seeing things like Elon Musk with SpaceX. You're seeing, uh, you know, planetary resources. You're seeing these private mining companies. And I think it's the same thing. Like, that there's this pent up demand to just get exploring space, please, and <laughs> and and these outlets that are that are starting to pop open now are saying, yeah, we can help you do that. And actually, it doesn't require all of this bureaucracy. It doesn't require all this cost. There's some there's some real opportunities to get this stuff happening. Don't wait. Let's just get cracking. So I think you're, you know, you're able to kind of capitalize on that. Well, thank you. Isn't it just great to have so many multiple space programs with uh, people who are just getting creative, like Dennis Tito and his Mars flyby pan. That's, that's a fantastic project. And so, so are the Google Lunar X Prize projects. And what Elon is doing is awesome. And they're all going in parallel like we are at Golden Spike. And we don't have to take turns as we would in a government space program where the money is more limited and the costs are oftentimes higher. And God bless NASA's heart, the most historic space agency in the world. Uh, and we're now on our way to Pluto, among other places. And NASA's on their way to ultimately exploring Mars with humans. But the commercial sector can do a lot of science in addition to doing things like space tourism. And that's what we're about. So if everything works out according to your plans uh, perfectly, uh, when do you think, when do you see things happening? I know you're doing this Indiegogo campaign right now. Uh, how will things play out in the future? Well, we're already involved with nine aerospace companies uh, doing designs for us. United Launch Alliance is an example. Paragon Space Systems is an example. Uh, Grumman, who built the Lunar Lander, is doing a Lunar Lander design study for us, even with some old hands from Apollo on board, and other companies as well. Uh, and we're going to be doing more detailed design studies, bigger ticket studies later this year. We hope to be procuring our rockets, capsules, and a lander uh, by the end of uh, 2015, and we expect to start flight tests in 2017, followed by first landing at the end of the decade, and then commercial operations all across the 2020s. And so specifically, when should I write the Canadian government and ask them to, to get on that mission? You should start now. I should start Canada now. Okay, all right. Canada, Canada would be just fantastic as the first right. back to the moon. All right, all right. First person back to the moon. I like it. All right, well, Alan, I know you've got to, you've got to rush. Uh, you've got to head out, so, uh, so we'll let you go. But thank you very much. Keep us up. Before we let you go, though, just to remind people, if they want to donate, if they want to participate, where do they go? Just, just Google Indiegogo, that's I-N-D-I-E-G-O-G-O, -G -O, and put Golden Spike after that. And you'll find the link at the top of your page and click it. That's all you have to do. Awesome. And we, I know we've written quite a bit on Universe Today as well, so we've got information there as well for people. So, well, thank you very much, Alan. Please give us, keep us updated, uh, you know, maybe in, in a few more months when you've uh, finished the campaign and you're, you're, you know, talking to the Canadian government. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. Thanks, all right. Alan. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Bye, guys. Bye, Alan. If I look a bit distracted, that's because I'm looking at my other monitor posting the links that uh, yes. we're talking about. So if you're on the event page, I'm posting the links there, and I will add them to the YouTube video uh, description at the end. So get your links. Um, okay, so I know we've got a, just a quick update. Uh, all four Dragon Thrusters are back online. Woo! Yes. So, Thank you. Very cool. Yeah. Dave you know, Tabor for pointing that out to us in the comments. That almost doesn't that almost feel you know a little suspicious that they had this dramatic problem and then they mm. fixed it and then everyone was talking about it. And wow, you're, it. Start, you're starting to sound like a lot of people I have to ban on forums. Yeah, I know. And, uh, you, <laughs> you know, Elon comes out with like a box of of like Lego and goes, "You need to fix this dragon thruster," and this is what we've got for the robot to fix it with. You know? But uh, yeah, all right. Well, that's awesome. That's that's great. All right, we'll keep we'll keep things updated. All right. Uh, so we're gonna move on. So Nicole, you're gonna talk about uh, galactic cannibalism. Sure. Um, nom nom galactic cannibalism. Uh, so there was a uh, let's see. I wrote an article about this earlier last earlier in the week. Um, we know that the the big galaxies like the Milky Way have 
in part grown to be so large because they've actually eaten other galaxies. And we say eaten, what we really mean is smaller galaxies, you know, fall into, get ripped apart, and the, their stars become part of our galaxy. So it's actually a very beautiful, uh, you know, wonderful gravitational process, but we like cannibalism because that it, it, zombies. Why galaxies not? eating other galaxies. We've got it. Galaxies eating other zombies. Why not? Cannibalism. So, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Sorry, I just <laughs> um, So a study was done um, of some of the stars in the halo of our Milky Way. So our, our Milky Way, we, we think of it as this, this you know, disk spiral galaxy, but there's actually this bigger halo of stars around it. Uh, if they tend to be the older stars, the stars that are lacking metals, where we use the traditional astronomer term for metals, anything heavier than helium. Uh, and so these older stars um, trace these earlier epochs of galactic formation. And so this new study using just 13 stars with, um, from, from the Hubble archive data. So this is the part that I really like. So they used this archive data that was originally in place to study the proper motion of the Andromeda galaxy. And so they have done that study and they've determined that the Andromeda galaxy is headed right for us. But all the foreground stars in those images, a lot of them are from the Milky Way. And so they went back to that data and used it for a purpose that wasn't even thought of when, when they first took this data. They used the Milky Way stars. They were able to extract 13 stars out of these images. And they discovered that instead of, you know, falling in towards the galaxy like they expected them to, but based on our models of how the galaxy, of how the Milky Way galaxy formed and accreted smaller galaxies, they've actually got this sideways motion in the sky. So they were able to measure these really precise proper motions, this really precise sideways motion in the sky and get the, the true velocity of these stars. And so it's unusual that they're moving in a sideways motion with respect to the galaxy. And so what's probably happening, what they think is happening, is that they've discovered another you know, population, a stream of older stars that were part of an early accretion event, this, this um, early event of galactic cannibalism. So it's really cool because, A, they used archive data for a purpose that it wasn't originally taken for. And so I love that. B, they took... This, this really high precision proper motion data with the Hubble Space Telescope. So Hubble and how many years it's been going, it's still doing such cutting edge science. And also um, three, C, <laughs> whatever naming system I was using, uh, they're, they're getting um, this, this look into the galactic history. And so they're actually proposing to use um, the Hubble Space Telescope again, since this was just done in one direction of the sky. Um, they are uh, going to propose to take more data Oh, and look through the archives as well at other data and see if they can um, measure this all across the sky because the halo is actually in every direction. It's not just uh, in that one direction towards Andromeda. So really cool science, uh, interesting use of, of, of Hubble archive data, and I'll post the link in the comments. I, I know what you mean about those kinds, of, those kinds of stories where people dig through some old archive. They, they, like they look through the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or something, mm -hmm. like that, and, they, and they discover a whole bunch of asteroids and and... Kuiper Belt objects and quasars and, and even sort of figure out some of the reasons behind them. But that data was in there all along. It just takes right. someone to go, I wonder if, and then they go and dig through the, the archive data and they actually find it. And so, you know, I think that if anybody wants to get involved in space and astronomy, that data is just kicking there. It's freely yeah. available on the internet. Anyone with a high-speed internet connection can dig it and start running their complicated, you know, Image processing. Their image yeah. processing and their queries on it, but it's just, you know, it's more, it's a programming challenge yes. less than necessarily an astronomy challenge, you know, once you know what you're looking for. So Absolutely. A lot, still... of our, a lot of the work astronomers do is programming, and we're yeah. not yeah. very good at it. So <laughs> That's what we always... the real programmers of the world can absolutely get their hands dirty in astronomy data. It's, yeah. it's usually um, freely available, depending on the telescope, um, it's usually freely available, you know, National Science Foundation funded, and NASA funded things are usually available six months to a year after the data is taken. So it gives the original um, proposers some time with the data to do, do what they want to do and publish it. But after that, the data is freely available. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey, that data is all freely available. Most of the software we use, it's complicated and messy and icky, but it's freely available. Yeah. Uh, so just one more update according to, this comes from Guido Bibra, according yeah. to Nancy Allen and Phil on Twitter, two thrusters are actually working and the other two are operational but still haven't been switched on. So we will continue to keep you posted. <laughs> Breaking update. Breaking news. Um, okay, this well, just so, in, folks. This just in. So uh, Jason, we're going to talk about baby planets. 
Sure. Um, well, you know, speaking of accretion, like Nicole was uh, was talking about with the galaxies, here's a a, a miniature version, but still uh, uh, quite interesting. Astronomers using the VLT array uh, over at the ESO uh, Observatory in the Paranal in Chile, what they were looking at a star about 335 light years away. The star's name is HD100546. And that star needs a name. That star needs a new name. Maybe, yeah. maybe Uingo can help with maybe that. Can help it's, got, it's got a ring to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this star has a, uh, a circumstellar disk around it, a protoplanetary disk of gas and dust, just you know, exactly the type of stuff that they think planets form out of, or that they know planets form out of. Our solar system formed out of a very similar disk of gas and dust, you know, four, four and a half, five billion years ago. So looking at HD 100546, what they found um, in the near infrared was, and I've got a picture of it here, pop this up. What they found here, what, oh, what, okay, I'll tell you what we're looking at here. On the left is a Hubble optical image of the disk of gas and dust around the star. And on the right is a kind of a zoom in with the um, with the VLT in near infrared, and that shows this bright blob of material. Um, wh what they did was they they were actually able to block out the, um, the the light from the star with a dark opaque disk in the uh, in the telescope. So that way they they can see the stuff that's happening around it. So in that in that uh, protoplanetary disk, they found this big blob of basically infrared bright material. That may be a planet forming. Um, now if it is a planet, it's a big planet. It's, it's going to be Jupiter size. It's going to be perhaps even bigger than Jupiter, maybe even uh, uh, 20 times the mass of Jupiter. So it's a large planet. Um, if, if it is a planet, that's still, you know, that's still under further research. But if it is a planet, then it's the first time that scientists have been able to actually spot a planet in formation in the process of uh, accreting from this from the gas and dust and and becoming you know something that that we might see in our solar system today as, as Saturn or Jupiter or something like that so that's really exciting because that's never been spotted before this this actual planetary formation process um, one of the interesting things about this, uh, this, this protoplanet and if it does get a name its name will be HD 100546 B um, is that it's pretty far away from the star. Uh, it's, it's, it's about 68 to 70 AUs, uh, astronomical units, away from the star. So that's 70 times the distance from its star as we are from the sun. Now, if that was in our solar system, that would be out in the Kuiper Belt. I mean, that would be past Pluto. That would be out around uh, Maki Maki and Eris and, and, you know, those icy worlds out there. So to see a, a big gas giant, a Jupiter-sized planet, out that far is a little strange. So they don't quite know, first of all, why it's there. And if it is there, how it got there. Did it, did it form there? Um, did it form closer in and got kicked out? They're not sure. But... Further observations will, you know, kind of give an idea about, you know, what's happening, uh, where it's coming from, you know, where it came from, and if, in fact, it actually is a planet forming, because there is the remote possibility that it could be a distant source that's shining through that protoplanetary disk, and, uh, uh, you know, it's basically an infrared source that's, you know, very distant and getting picked up. Not likely, but it's possible, so... But you can it. imagine in the next couple of years when the uh, James Webb Space Telescope launches and, it, you know, it's got so much more resolving power, yeah. it's going to be able to get to the bottom of, of these kinds of mysteries. So. Well, I'm, I'm right. sure that'll That's be one of the first things. That, I'm sure that'll yeah. be one of the, one of the uh, uh, things on its short list to, get, yeah. you know, take a look at. Observe, you know, observe planets, you know, track the cars on distant planets and can, people can walking around. Can I be a yeah. jerk and say Alma will see it first? Alma will see it first. Do you think it's gonna? You think it's gonna pull it off before? Oh, so. uh, right. it depends on what it's emitting, but yeah. All right, uh, Ian. We're gonna move to Ian now, and you're gonna talk about spinning black holes. Yeah, um, this, this is was one of those stories that I regretted 
even looking into. So it was one of those. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, the thing is, so I got in touch with uh, the Cal Caltech PR guy because um, I found you know anything to do with black holes really cool. And I said, look, can I speak to some scientists about this? It sounds really nice to write about. I'll, I'll jump into it. So I lined up these interviews, and as soon as I started speaking to the uh, the scientists, I thought, oh no. This isn't going to be pleasant. So I had to crack open the textbooks, and it took about a day to write. But the the, the abridged version is this: basically, uh, talking of accretion disks, <laughs> black holes like accretion disks as well. So um, a nearby galaxy, I say nearby, um, it's like fifty six uh, million light years away. It's uh, NGC thirteen sixty five. NGC 1365 is also called the Great Barred Spiral Galaxy. Um, astronomers are very uh, keen to study this galaxy because it's got um, a, an active galactic nucleus. So basically the central black hole is feeding and it's generating quite a lot of x-rays. Uh, it's been the subject of some studies in the past and um, the x-rays have been uh, analyzed and there's been this broadening of the iron line. So basically emissions from iron ions in the accretion disk have shown this broadening. Now, astronomers get very, very excited about broadening lines because this can mean a few things. Either they are measuring the relativistic effects of a black hole right near the event horizon, which is so cool, or it could be a little bit more mundane. It could be that these X-rays are firing through clouds of gas between us and the central black hole that's therefore broadening the lines. So there's been like this astrophysics very geeky controversy over what this, this line broadening actually means in x-rays and there's been one camp that's saying it's relativistic effects, it's because of this huge black hole, it's actually warping space-time, stretching um, this, this emission line, this spectrum. Um, and there's the other camp that said, no, no, it's a little bit more mundane. It's just because it's, yes, it's a black hole that's generating lots of x-rays, it's consuming lots of material, it's firing out um, uh, these, these jets, and it's producing x-rays, and these x-rays are going through these clouds of gas, therefore stretching the line. So forget your relativistic theory. But now with the brand new New Star uh, array, New Star um, telescope that's in, in, in orbit around Earth, it was launched back, I think, June last year. And it's starting to do some really cool uh, analysis of higher energy X-rays. It turned its attention to, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to this galaxy and did its own measurements of the X-rays being generated. And it actually found that the high energy um, the higher energy x-rays, in fact I've got a screen share, let me see if this works. Da -da -da. Yeah. All right, can we see, I think we can see it. That's How a much? nice graph. You like my graph? Yeah, my computer's now frozen, so this probably wasn't a good idea, but I'm going to... Is there a PowerPoint presentation, too? <laughs> yeah, yeah my, my computer is... Insert goes, comment my... about x-ray astronomers counting photons. Yeah. I love you, Dan. Uh, so, so basically, on this graph, this very interesting graph, on the far left-hand side, you can see... Oh, uh, now it's crashed. Ah, hang it's on, gone. hang on. I can put it up. Have yeah, let, it? let Nicole, oh, let Nicole handle it. Yeah, it, it doesn't like doing two things at once. Yeah, you don't, you don't need to think on that and try to talk about it at the same time. It's very complicated. <laughs> yeah, well, well, basically, I mean, if, if you see that graph or not, it doesn't matter because there's one line that says that, it's, that this broadening is due to um, relativistic effects, and there's the other line that's due to um, uh, gas obscuring this, uh, this uh, iron line. As it Come turns out, both. new star... What's that? Come on, both. I want, that's my that's my hope. Both. Everything's always both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, basically, New Star has now said, okay, well, we've we've um, detected X rays in the gravitational distortion regime. So therefore, this the X rays are actually seeing are coming from the inner part of this accretion disk. So the very the closest part of the accretion disk next to the the black hole is actually due to this relativistic effect, and you can use this relativistic effect to measure the spin of a black hole. So they not only dis decisively prove that this this line broadening is due to um, this warping of space time, it's also due to the spinning of a black hole, and they managed to gauge the black hole spinning a huge. Uh, number, um, I forget how fast it was, but it's around about 84% is fastest possible speed. So in other words, it's going like a relativistic spinning. And right. 
and it's just incredible that now we're able to probe this strong um, gravitational field right next to the surface of a black hole. Right. So you've got this situation where, you know, as these black holes form and as they create this material and gather more material, although what's actually going inside this event horizon is a complete and total mystery. It's sure, still, yeah. you know, it still conforms to certain kinds of physics. And one of these is that it spins, which I guess is, was even, wasn't even unknown. Like, you know, they didn't know would it spin if it comes inside. And so now we know that it's spinning and it's spinning so fast that, that right at the edge, it's, it's grabbing the, the accretion disk next to it. And, and so you're saying that you can actually detect the speed of that rotation based on the broadening of the lines from these x-rays. Yeah, exactly. As we see them. And, and that was the, the key thing with this was, you know, the physics was hard. I mean, it was really difficult. And I found it interesting anyway. But I was writing it down thinking, so what? So I had to get on the phone to the scientist. And I was saying, so what's the point of this? She goes, no, it's amazing because the spin of a black hole, it gives an indication about what it went through in its recent history or the oh, yeah. distant history, how it actually formed, how it actually grew. Because the key thing is, how did it get to spin so fast? How, why is it spinning in the first place? And it's basically the amount of material that's falling into the black hole and how active the black hole has been in the past. A spin can also reveal whether it was once two black holes. So say if two galaxies merge together, like this galactic cannibalism that Nicole was just talking about, perhaps these central black holes merged, and of course anything falling onto a black hole make it spin faster. And so you're, you've, by having this amazing ability of looking at the X-rays coming from the central nucleus of an active galaxy, you can actually have some gauge, you can do some like black hole archaeology, you can actually work out what's happened to that black hole in the past? Why is it spinning so fast and what actually happened to it? And the, the key thing as well with active galactic nuclei, they can drastically impact star formation in their host galaxy. So you're not only looking at this really cool physics of this black hole, you're actually looking at the physics of the whole galaxy just by looking at this line broadening of an X-ray. And NASA's new star telescope is like mind-bogglingly amazing at doing this, at analyzing these higher energy uh, x-rays and basically getting rid of this whole controversy over whether right. it's relativistic effects or and you said some other matter. And you said 84%, but the you know the possibility here is, and I know theoretically these these supermassive black holes can spin up to essentially 99 point whatever the speed yeah. of light. Like that's the final speed limit is light sp light speed. Exactly. They can't, yeah. they can't cross light speed, and they'll just keep getting closer and closer to light speed as they get more material. Yeah, and I don't know about you, but I'm just really excited for this new movement to try and actually image uh, black holes event horizon. You know, actually oh, taking first totally. first imagery. I mean, yeah, Nicole. I mean, it's, I think first it's going to be um, radio astronomy. That does it's going it to be it's going to be the millimeter. Yeah, the millimeter radio telescopes um, that they link together from Arizona to Hawaii to Chile. Yeah. Um, they have been working so hard on that, and I've I've been. So, oh my God, so it was 10 years ago, I was doing my first REU and they were like starting that. And yeah. so to see them getting closer to an image is, is um, cool. Now, I got a question on Google Plus from Andrew Planet saying, with mm -hmm. black hole high energy jets accepted as fact nowadays, can the old notion that nothing can escape the gravitational pull of a black hole be said to incorrect? Yeah. Uh, no. Ian, so no, right? No, uh, basically, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, ambiguity as the physics very close to a black hole. We, we, we can't actually, uh, even though we're receiving this radiation, we're actually understanding this radiation a bit better. The X-ray is coming out of a black hole, well, uh, mm -hmm. close to the black hole's event horizon. Um, some of the physics is still not completely understood. For some reason, you've got these accretion disks that go around the black hole. It's like a spiraling funnel of water going down a plug hole. So a lot of that material will fall into the black hole. But there's some acceleration, some physics close to the event horizon of a black hole, which accelerates this material and blasts it away as jets out of the poles of the north, out of the um, out of the. Uh, away from the black hole, um, from the poles of the black hole. And these it's are the twisting jets. magnetic fields, is it not? I yeah. mean, they, you know, they get up and That's what collimates the jets. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah it's, uh, it's magnetic effects very, very, very close to the black hole. And it blasts out this material at relativistic speeds and it generates lots of radiation. And that's how we, that's how we detect this radiation. And in fact, the X-rays the new star picked up were the, it's actually the reflected X-rays coming from these collimated jets. These, mm -hmm. they act almost like a heating source. They reflect down onto the disc, which is below, heating it and uh, making these iron ions generate this light that they can detect. Um, so yeah, everything falls into the black hole. Uh, nothing's actually coming out of the black hole. It's right. actually being redirected around the black hole. 
The problem here yeah. is language. When we say nothing comes out of a black hole, we mean once it crosses the event horizon, nothing can escape. When yes. we say we see a black hole doing this stuff, what we really mean is it's the region right outside the event horizon where all of this activity is happening that we see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we've just been joined by uh, Nancy Atkinson from uh, Universe Today. Hey, Nancy. Nancy. Hey, Nancy. We've Hi been there. we've been mentioning you and your uh, watching the the Dragon launch and the and the issues they've been having. So, uh, did you want to give us a quick update on what's happening with with Dragon? We we just mentioned we just said that from what we understand, all of the thrusters are operational again, and and so, what do we know now? Well, um, some people on Twitter are saying that they're all operational. However, during the, the press conference, Elon Musk said that just two are operational, so I haven't gotten confirmation on that. But <clears throat> we did learn a little bit more about the nature of the problem, and let me look at my notes here because I was trying to write it all down. But there seemed to be a blockage in the helium line leading to the oxidizer pressurization, and that was the issue. Those um, are tricky. That, yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this and so you a that lot was the issue. Yeah. They weren't getting enough pressure for the, for the thrusters to actually operate. And um, but now the pressure is all nominal. Nominal. And so um, he's very hopeful that they're going to work right. They just haven't brought the other two up yet, or or they have. I don't know which. But they but can anyway, dock with two, right? They have to have three. Oh really? According, okay. According to Mike Suffredini. Oh, this is right on the edge. Them. Will they make it? Let's yeah. get the new. You know, people are going to be. Oh, I was just mentioning at the beginning a bit of a conspiracy theory about how, uh, you know, how this is just like you know Elon Musk uh, digging up. Uh, I'll wield the band don't, hammer don't here too. Yeah. <laughs> don't encourage. I know. I will. SpaceX is joking. I'm joking. The headquarters is in LA, so yeah. you'd expect yeah. that. Yeah. Bit of Hollywood. Yeah. So uh, any, uh, anyway, so on. Jonathan Langdale's mentioning on, on YouTube that they have nominal pressure on all four now. Yeah, the pressure was fine. They just haven't turned them all on. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but the kind of, uh, you know, nerdy cool factor that he talked about was that, you know, the um, they did bring up the, or extend the solar arrays early. You know, normally they do have to have the two thrusters online to, um, to uh, deploy the solar arrays, but they deployed them um, with only one because of two reasons. One, um, they uh, thought the solar rays might get too cold if they, you know, if they left them in too long and they wouldn't deploy correctly. But the really cool thing was that um, the spacecraft was actually kind of spinning out of control and so that they did it like, you know, put the arms out kind of like a you know, how a oh, skater Oh, to slow the rays down. Spin. Yeah, so that, isn't that kind of nerdy cool? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really clever. So, yeah, um, so uh, they thought there was, um, you know, the temperatures of the of the helium and the oxidizer were fine, so they don't think that it was frozen, but there could have been a frozen piece and that could have been blocking it. But they said they've been, like, turning the valves off and on and kind of hammering them open, and that seemed to do the trick as far as getting the pressure correct. Fantastic, so, okay. Um, uh, a, a big, an important thing is that they need to do a burn within the next... Um, I guess I don't remember how soon they need to do it, but um, the perigee is not high enough right now, and if they don't do it within a day or so, they would end up having to re-enter. And another thing he said that, you know, if once they do get into the proper orbit, that um, Dragon could actually be on orbit for several months, and, you know, with the solar arrays, they'd have enough power to, to uh, operate the spacecraft. Um, so, um, but they he did say that, you know, if things weren't looking good uh, as far as docking that, um, you know, they'd probably give it a month at the most as far as getting docked. But they hope to to um, uh, approach the station probably no sooner than Sunday. And, um, you know, and that, that is if they do get three out of four pods working. So Right, um, but they have, a, you know, if they can get this going and they can change their orbit, then they've got a month to tinker with the system to get it working if they if they really need to. I mean, there's, fortunately, there's nobody on board, so... Right. You know, yeah. yeah, and, and you this know, so time around. people did ask about, you know, if this was a crude um, drag-in, would this, you know, this have been a real problem? And Elon Musk said that they're planning that the crude dragon will not have solar rays, that they'll just have a bigger battery pack. And um, he did say that the battery pack would have lasted 12 to 14 hours 
Um, that was one thing that I was looking for online. I couldn't find it anywhere. And because uh, of how long, in case they didn't get the solar arrays deployed, how long they were going to be able to uh, to function. But it is about 12 to 14 hours, he said. Right. That's that's great. So well, let's, well, I guess it, this story is going to stretch out. So we'll keep people posted. Hopefully we'll know by next week. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that so, they've docked. And I've, I've been live blogging on Universe Today, so I'll update that with the info I got from the press conference. And uh, and then, yeah, we'll just keep going, I guess. Fantastic. No, your coverage has been excellent. Thanks. Really, we've all been watching it. It's been fantastic. So, yeah, I'm looking um, over at Twitter. I'm like, oh, wait, yeah. I'm, I'm actually in a show right now. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, Nancy just said, Alan just said, so like two of our cohort are, are off giving really excellent coverage while the rest of us hold the fort. So so that's great. Uh, so why don't we move on? We're running out of time. So Amy, we uh, we want to talk to you about the uh, Dennis Tito's 2018 mission. Yeah, um, so, yes. Um, so the idea is a... Uh, two man or uh, two married couple, single married couple, two people, that would be, um, flyby of Mars launching on January 5th, 2018. Um, it's really soon, and so the good in this mission is that it's a flyby. Um, trajectory speaking, it's feasible because once you, you know, get yourself punted towards Mars, you just let Newton do the driving and whip around and maybe adjust yourself here and there, but really you can, you can do that pretty easily and, and come back without worrying too much. Um, that's about as much technical information as they gave in the press conference. Um, I don't know if anyone else sat in on it and watched it on Wednesday, but it was they, they kind of talked about how the trajectory was easy and how they have some, you know, um, Ah, I'm losing my words today. <laughs> they have nope. some some things about like radiation and how to protect people, and some idea of how to how to keep them sane. There was some mention of like Doctor Phil of all people doing marriage counseling to this couple en route to Mars. Um, no, but they are <laughs> now is there a reason why they're recommending a married couple? And if so, they are going to do a married couple, can we? You know, what about a gay married couple? Because that would also no. Be there's no gay married couple, really? and there's no foreign couple. So Fraser, you are not allowed to apply. Wait, um, wait, does anybody else here? I, you know what, Fraser, I would marry you just I know, we would totally so, go. That's so, so, on Mars. Yeah. So and in Canada. Like, yeah, which is weird that it's not here. It was yeah. one thing I noticed when I moved. Alright, so, so Fraser and I are going to get married and we are going to go to Mars. I'm, I'm jealous. jealous. I'm Canadian. I'm jealous. Jealous. This is a sorry. terrible idea. Terrible idea. Okay, so, so why, so the why thing, marry? The only thing in this press conference that sounds Shut up and let me finish. <laughs> I have so many questions. <laughs> is that it's a it's a free return trajectory. It's pretty easy. Um, great. Okay. They didn't say what the launch vehicle is going to be. They didn't say what the <laughs> spacecraft is going to be. I I've heard rumblings that they lost any sponsorship with SpaceX. And even if they hadn't, SpaceX is not man rated, nor is the Falcon Heavy built. Um, they didn't say anything about radiation protection. They didn't really address the fact that it will be a married couple crammed in a tiny room with everything they will need in terms of food, oxygen, waste storage, including human waste storage, for 501 days. And there's absolutely no chance for abort. There's no, like, you know, that magic point where you become, where you're closer to Mars than Earth, um, where you could, you know, just do a big old burn and come right back. They don't have that. Once they're punted out, they're they're gone. Um, and and so they'll spend, they'll spend the 500 days. Hunter. Yeah, cramped 501 in a, very boring days. Yeah, very boring days. And then a couple of days where you stare the out the window. the excitement of seeing Mars. And, yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of, like, interesting aspects to this, but there's a lot of more things that are making me say, uh... <laughs> I, did see something, I did see something today in regards to uh, protection from radiation, and um, maybe, you know, maybe this couple could entertain themselves by uh, decorating the inside of their spaceship, because what they propose to do is use their waste um, <laughs> to... Yes. to provide a layer of protection against yes. cosmic radiation yeah. Um, yeah. Hope, you know, by putting it in bags and putting it around the inside. Of the Water is the painting. best form of... Yeah, which, um, which sort of goes against the idea of eating low-residue diets in space to minimize human waste and the yeah. fact that all of their urine will be recycled into potable water. Right. So, 
Yeah. But water is one of the most sort of best ways to protect yeah. yourself from radiation in space. So theoretically, you know, if you just build line a spacecraft, walls, line yeah. your walls with your water supply, and then you're inside that, then you've got yeah. you know use your food and water as as uh, protection. Um, yeah. The um the the someone I I forget who asked the question about radiation and sort of increased risk of cancers and stuff, and and the line was, well, we can deal with cancer when they're back on Earth. So. That's it's Mars, you know. I I would I would <laughs> risk cancer if I got to go to Mars. I, but would you? But would you risk would. being crammed in a tiny spacecraft with your spouse? <laughs> no, I c I could break a record for having the first space divorce, and you know. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah. now Jonathan Langdale is saying uh, that on the panel there was a woman on the panel and her husband that have probably already been selected to go. So so there's that's... um I forget who what her name was um. Sorry, I don't, Jane, not just, not my just my Eric Jane, married couple. It's this specific specific method. married couple, right? Okay. So he's not proposing. He's not proposing that you know a married couple be would married. be the best group. Just that the people they've chosen are this married couple. Because well, you know, like, what about yeah. identical it's twins? They or... really like each other. Yeah. Jane, I think Pointer. I think it was the the woman Jane who had Pointer. met who had done a biosphere study and had met her husband in this really intensive isolation um, situation, and and she had found that you know, connecting with this person under adverse circumstances and having an outlet was a really positive experience and they ended up getting married, which is great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that put back in a much, much more intense adverse situation because I have strongly feel that you cannot actually ever simulate a Mars environment on Earth because you know you're on Earth. Um, what, I, don't, I can't, yeah, I can't imagine not killing someone. <laughs> Well, well, it's like the yeah. Mars 500 experiment yeah. in in Russia. Yeah. I mean, but they, even, that was on Earth. <laughs> even that one, like they know that if anything happens, if anything, you know, desperate situation, there's a guy on the other side of that wall. They can open the door and let them out. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a mental aspect to that, knowing that you're actually safe and that people are actually monitoring you and that nothing can happen. Whereas, if you're, you know, half of million miles away from Earth and you have no way to come back and something goes terribly wrong, you just gotta tough yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah. The people were Jane Pointer yeah. and Tabor McCallum. Yeah. There you go. They were, they right. were in okay. Biosphere too. Right. But, but I mean, yeah. I, I can see that line of thinking that if you take two people who already went through Biosphere 2 and demonstrated that they have, you know, great personalities and can withstand this kind of, you know, entrapment and for 500 days, right? That that yeah. maybe that maybe they've got the right psychological profile to avoid space madness. But yeah, yeah. But they did but say I, that they were going to have a, a a competition or a, you know a, a a process to pick someone. Yeah. And I think if they were going to go through all that, but they just decided to choose Tabor and Jane already, then I mean I think that would be dumb because they're <laughs> they're actually leading part of the project. So well, what they're what they're trying to do is sell the media rights to the whole process for right. funding, and mm. this is probably I mean it's probably a, a ploy if they're if they've already selected the crew and they want to run this contest, it's probably just a way of driving interest. And, yeah, know, oh, that's an application Dr. fee. Uh, that's where <laughs> you get all your your funding, right? Eight thousand dollars to ent enter this contest so that you're not going to win. So Andrew Planet mentioned actually over on Universe Today that someone had mentioned in the comments that sending small people to use less resources might be a good idea. Hi, right? hi, hi! I'm yeah. one. Yeah, <laughs> Amy, I think ten. you're you're four like four, ten. you're four <laughs> four ten, right? Yeah. yeah. And I need very little. <laughs> yeah, so I think Amy would oh, be. So we could just hang perfect, out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You would be the. Yeah, you guys would be the perfect. Uh, but that means we can send three of you. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. Extra. <laughs> yeah. And the lower gravity on Mars, it'll you know that you can still carry around gigantic one-ton. Let's uh, plan. You know, objects. Well, to yeah. Tony, see... Tony Darnell, our, our good friend Tony, also pointed out. I'm cracking up at the comments here. The yeah. future astronaut core: old people past childbearing years. Luckily, I qualify. Where's my walker? <laughs> <laughs> Tony, you're not that old. <laughs> All um, right. Well. We're, yeah, we're... there was something too. They wanted a married couple that wasn't fertile. Right. <laughs> Even well, though I don't know. We're not fertile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it and sounds that, like they wanted thinking, a married that couple that, that was this specific married couple. Would be would be great because because the radiation is going to roast all that stuff out yeah. of you. Anyway. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. already that's done that in, in my physics right. labs as an undergrad. Well, that's so. ex that's it. That's why I was proposing a same sex couple because then you're not going to yeah. have the pregnancy problem, which then yeah. introduces a third party into the mix. Now that would get complicated. 
to have a yeah. child. Mama. Oh. Anyway, all right, so we're running out of time. So before we got to go, and, and we, can, we have Scott here for a reason, and that is that we want to <laughs> talk about... We love that we like Scott. Wow, yeah. yeah. I have to qualify my reasoning to be here. Yeah. I love it. So Scott, j so justify your existence and <laughs> tell us all about this awesome event that's happening this week, South by Southwest. <laughs> Well, it's because I'm there, and that's why it's so awesome. Um, so next week, Fraser, myself, Nicole, Pamela will be there with Tony Darnell, um, Alberto. We're going to be all down at South by Southwest with NASA James Webb Space Telescope, where they will have the full-scale model of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I have an image here to compare. So we have the Hubble Space Telescope, which is all run by the Space Telescope Science Institute. And here is the comparison. Just Maybe fancy. if I chose the right screen share, it might help. There we go. Um, pull this up. Although my Google Hangout is freaking out on me. That's awesome. So just to let people know hey, the, the model, right? Yeah, it's the size. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. So this is the Hubble Space Telescope mirror. This is a human. This is the new mirror for the James Webb Space Telescope. So it's much larger. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope is about the size of a bus, whereas the James Webb Space Telescope the size of a tennis court. Yeah. It's enormous. And yeah, Nicole has um, an image up there right now. I know they're setting it up right now. They've had it over in Battery Park in New York is, um, like two years ago, two, three years ago. This is in, um, in Germany, this picture uh, from 2007. It's huge. And um, from some things that Jason was mentioning earlier, as far as using the, the near-infrared wavelengths and things like that. So it's not going to be like Hubble, where it's going to be looking in optical and some of the ultraviolet. It's going to be mainly in the infrared, near-infrared, the orangish colors on, on longer, to be able to look to the farthest depths and being able to look through, at, at galaxy and planet uh, formation and things like that. So we'll be down there with, with NASA. We'll be doing lots of outreach going on. We'll be doing our weekly space hangout. So this next week, we'll actually be live from South by Southwest. We'll be having our virtual star party as well on Sunday, live from South by Southwest. We'll be, there'll be, let's see, we have so much going Internet on. Night. We're going to have John Grunsfeld is going to be down there doing um, a talk about the Hubble Space Telescope repairs. There will be a Guinness World Record attempt for having the largest astronomy course um, ever. And so that's that's going to be all down there at Austin. It's free for any of the public that wants to come by. So you don't need to have any South by Southwest badges or anything like that. You can come by um, down to the Long Center, and we'll be all out there doing citizen science. We'll be there with CosmoQuest trying to get you all to to map the moon. That's right. Um, We're going to be running around with our iPads and laptops just like, Check out Cosmo Quest. Yeah. Yes, and we uh, will see. definitely be tied to the to the model. We'll be around the model, around the telescopes, or in the NASA tent. You'll be able to find us, you know. And so definitely come by and say hi. Yeah, uh, John Mather will be there as well, doing keynotes on Saturday and Sunday, and uh, Tony Darnell will be there as well. I'll be working with him with the rest of the crew. We're doing some video and trying to do some awesome videos for afterwards, or if we can be that crazy, try to put something out while we're down there. But I doubt it. Um, but yeah, it's it's just gonna be a whole lot of fun, and it's free to the public. So please feel free to feel free to drop by, say hi to us, um, come do some science with us, get some pictures with a huge space telescope. Here's a awesome. here's a picture of the uh, here's a picture of the model. I think it's in uh, over in Maryland, um, with yep. the team with the yeah. team there. So that thing's mo that thing's monstrous. That's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's gonna be amazing. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think we're I think we're ready to wrap this up. So before we do, let's uh, make sure that everyone knows where they can find out more. Uh, so Amy, where do we find more Amy Shira title? Uh, Amy Shira title dot com. My blog Vintage Space is there, and I'm also uh, Discovery News and Motherboard and Device and Google Plus. And now Al Jazeera. Yeah, that happened. And, and I think you're going to do some more stuff for us too. So <laughs> you are the hardest working. <sighs> freelance space journalist out there. <laughs> Except for Ian O'Neill. Uh, Ian, where do we find you, more about you? Um, I live mainly on Discovery News. Um, so discoverynews.com, have a look on there, and the space, that's my domain. Uh, I've got lots of writers, including uh, Amy 
and uh, and Jason on this, and 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 Nicole. I collect I collect space writers. <laughs> this is so cool. I mean, this we're, is kind of we're dominating on this this hangout. I know we we we're locked in Mortal Kombat. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of soft and fuzzy Mortal Kombat. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of hugs. <laughs> yeah. A lot of hugs. Yeah. <laughs> as we uh, as we yeah. control Who's competitions. Who's getting married? Competition's getting married? really yeah. stiff, Fraser. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Jason Major, where do we find more Jason? I'm over at Universe Today. I'm over at uh, Discovery News Space and my own blog, LightsInTheDark.com. Awesome. And you can find me on Twitter at JP Major. And of course, Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today. Yep, Universe Today, Nancy underscore A on Twitter. And, and Google Nicole, Plus, too. And Dr. Nicole Gallucci, where do we find out more about you? Uh, I am at NoisyAstronomer.com. I am at CosmoQuest.org. Discovery, over with Ian. And uh, I would like to announce that we've launched a new blog. I'm also right for the Skeptic Network, and we've launched a new education blog called School of Doubt. That just launched this morning, so come, come play. Nice. And Scott, where do we find out more? Everywhere. Um, Google Plus. I'm on Twitter at the Ball Astronomer. I am with CosmoQuest, Astrosphere, New Media. Uh, my own personal website is knowthecosmos.com. And, and we'll virtual see you star parties yeah, on Sundays. Sunday night, we're going to do another virtual star party. So yep. you'll be there for that? Absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you uh, all of the uh, everyone for joining. Thanks for Alan, who uh, was able to give us that, uh, that guest visit today. That was fantastic. And thanks yeah. to everyone who watched. And we'll see you all for the next thing, which is going to be the virtual star party. It's going to be on Sunday night when it gets dark on the West Coast. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.